All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to day three of the African Health Agenda Com International Conference for 2021. This session as hosted by the IFEME is on the topic, why an African medicines agency and why now? To give a brief overview to this, this session brings patients, industry, product development partnerships and other public and private health stakeholders around the table to explain why AMA is key to optimizing sustainability in the supply of medicinal health products for diseases disproportionately affecting Africa. As a background to this, two years ago after the treaty agreed to establish an African medicines agency, over 50 leading organizations called heads of states and governments to ratify the treaty as a matter of priority. Although there has been political support, legal commitment for, from more countries remain to be secured for the continent-wide regulatory agency to become a reality. The treaty has so far been signed by 19 countries, but only eight out of the necessary 15 have ratified it. Following the multi-stakeholder call to AU heads of state to ratify the AMA treaty, the panel will seek to bring its content to the attention of African health organizations having a stake in its implementation and explain its importance in the journey towards universal health coverage. This afternoon, I'll be engaging a number of key experts and panelists to discuss broadly the issue around why AMA must happen and must happen now. I'll be, I am Philip Silas Itagoto and I'll be moderating the session today to give a brief introduction about myself. I'm currently the chairman of Arepi, the Industry Association of Ethical Pharmaceutical Company Industries in Ghana. I've been working in this, in this position with other stakeholders to shape policies that impact on access to medicines broadly in Ghana. In addition to this, I've also worked together with the FDA to launch a marketing code to regulate ethical standards in marketing of pharmaceutical products in Ghana. I have close to 15 years of pharma industry experience at different levels of increasing leadership responsibility. And I currently work with Novartis as head of English West Africa business operations and country head for Novartis operations in Ghana. In this afternoon's session, I'll be taking perspectives of key experts on what their thoughts are regarding AMA treaty ratification and the setup of an African regulatory body. Just a brief uh, information to, uh, before I, I engage uh, the panelists for this afternoon session, uh, please, uh, Kindly put your questions within the chat and at the end of the panel discussion, I will be kind enough to take your questions and, add, and get our panelists to address them. So to quick start the discussions for today, I'm going to call upon our first speaker who is in the person of Mary Amponsa. Mary Amponsa is the president and CEO of the Global Alliance of Sickle Cell of Disease Organizations. Mary, this afternoon, I would be very glad if you can share with us your, pers your perspective or the perspective of the patient on how AMA can help deliver timely access of quality, safe, and effective medicinal products to patients on the continent and how patients expect to engage with the future agency. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philip. And um, I am Mary Equiampoma. Good afternoon, everybody from Ghana. Um, on behalf of the Global Alliance of Sickle Cell Disease Organization, the Board of Directors, and the Sickle Cell Community, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the organizers of this um, program, this impactful program, which is um, IPO and the Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association. Thank you so much for this impactful program. I'm so excited to be here. 
Now, Global Alliance of Sickle Cell Disease Organization, which is GASTO, was formed um, to have a unified voice for the sickle cell community. And we are made up of so many um, national and regional sickle cell support groups and other stakeholders like pharmaceutical companies, volunteers, and other people who are interested in um, um, sickle cell. So um, we are global. Um, we are very global. <laughs> but then um, one of the core uh, objectives of GASTO is to inspire hope and to ensure that um, no matter where any sickle cell patient is living, they have um, quality care in terms of comprehensive care. So GASTO wants to eliminate um, issues related to geographical health inequalities, stigmatization, and um, treatment barriers. But then uh, we have challenges, and we have challenges because, um, because of accessibility and availability of drugs when it comes to making sure that no matter where anybody is, they have comprehensive care. So um, in terms of availability of drugs, when we when we look at it globally, yes, developed countries have access, but when it comes to um, low and middle income countries, um, like countries in I mean, Africa, we don't really have access. Um, if you look at Ghana, um, I remember that um, I work in one of the largest adult sickle cell clinic in Ghana. And um, before 2019, November, most patients who usually get crisis have not have not have access to um, disease modifying drugs like hydroxyurea, which has been which has been in existence for um, about thirty um, decades, three sorry three decades now. They haven't had access to it, so they still go through crisis, frequent crisis, which is impacting on their quality of life. So um, Novartis came in in 2019 and made it accessible. Um, they, they roll out free hydroxyurea in most of the treatment centers in Ghana. Now, the question is, um, when it comes to AMA, when it comes to AMA, we think that AMA will be helpful here because we know that when um, drugs are locally manufactured, right? When drugs are locally man manufactured, they become cheaper. So AMA, I know that AMA is a regulatory um, agency and is going to harmonize all regulatory agencies in Africa to, to ensure that um, drugs are locally manufactured so that uh, disease modifying drugs like hydroxyurea will be locally manufactured to, to improve accessibility and affordability among patients. And secondly, to I think that um, when it comes to manufacturing, AMA is going to make sure that drugs that are made accessible, especially existing um, disease modifying drugs will be safe and of high quality. So um, AMA comes in handy to, to, to the sickle cell community. Then also when it comes to biosimilars of, of I mean drugs, AMA is going to make sure that yes, um, these drugs that are, that are being manufactured, these innovative disease modifying drugs that are being manufactured, yes, um, they will, um, when they, when they are manufactured, yes, um, they will ensure that um, they will be approved immediately and quickly in all countries so that um, they will be manufactured quickly for, for accessibility and availability. Then also, I think that um, when it comes to antibiotics, uh, AMA is going to prevent another second pandemic in that uh, all these antibiotics running in our, 
in our, in our market, they will ensure that um, the, the regulations are adhered to and fake drugs are being taken away, especially with this antibiotic so that um, patient will get access to um, quality and safe drugs. Then one recommendation that I know that AMA is going to take seriously is to actively involve and engage patient groups, patient and caregivers in the sickle cell community should be engaged when it comes to um, decisions concerning drugs. And this will, um, this will really impact the, the free movement and accessibility and availability of drugs in our communities. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mary Ampoma, for sharing. I'm so grateful that you, you touch on certain key areas that AMA will impact when it's implemented fully. Just to continue, we'll, we'll take perspective of the, page, uh, of the students, pharmacist, or the student in training. I'll be calling on Ni Ophulianan, Chairperson, African Regional Office International Pharmaceutical Students Federation. Ni Ophulianan will be sharing with us perspectives of why AMA will help build back better during and post COVID-19 and how will it contribute to pandemic preparedness for future generations in Africa? Hi, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. Thank you, Philip, for the opportunity. And I'd also like to thank um, the executive committee of IPSF and also um, my colleague students that helped me in preparing for this session. A uh, special thanks to also Mr. Bakanin Tube, one of our uh, members that is working on um, regulatory frameworks for his MSc. And he's actually written a really superb paper on um, why um, AMA is so important, the challenges that we faced um, in establishing it, and then going forward, how we can probably um, it will fix those challenges. So I'd like to begin by uh, stating that the establishment of the AFB um, is very important as students and youth um, in healthcare, especially pharmacists and young graduates and uh, pharmacy students. Um, the standardized frameworks that would have been existing across the continent as a result of um, the AMA being established would have improved our continent's um, emergency response to the global pandemic um, through activities such as research, of course, um, in um, our classrooms, um, R&D in um, the pharma industries, and also equitable access of safe and effective vaccines across Africa um, in such, um, you know, an example is COVID-19 and um, the Ebola outbreaks that are continent-based. Um, in turn, the drastic effects that COVID-19 has had on education, um, especially pharmacy education this past year, would have been minimal or non-existent. So um, it just goes to re-ascertain our position on the importance of why this um, really special organization or agency needs to be established and ratified by our government. Um, the AMA would be providing pharmacists and pharmacy students as well a more streamlined and aligned framework for medicine um, research, especially our African traditional medicines, especially in a time when we want to um, improve access of, and safety of African traditional medicines, and their development, their production, their distribution across the continent. And these are um, three key areas that we have, we as IPSF has not, have noticed that for us young pharmacists um, in, and pharmaceutical scientists, um, the establishment of this agency would help us. The first area is in education. Um, in education, teaching becomes easier and relatable for us students because knowledge on regulatory science becomes more accessible with better resources and collaborations on teaching and learning across borders in Africa. And for international students organizations like IPSF, things become a lot more simplified because we run a lot of projects and um, guidelines for our members. And then if we have these um, streamlined areas of education for our members, for instance, if um, medicines regulation um, frameworks in Zimbabwe 
will probably be the same or similar to those that we have here in Ghana. It may be a lot more easy for international student organizations to be able to provide these um, projects and areas of learning for our members. Um, it will bring regulatory science knowledge as well on a relatively higher level for our students. A lot of us graduate um, without having um, a lot of knowledge in regulation. And I think that impacts our practice as pharmacists. Um, the second area is in the area of science. Um, we realize that in harmonization of scientific processes to improve on our local drug um, production and distribution. Pharmacists and pharmacy students especially can apply a lot of their scientific methods in the labs um, to improve livelihoods across the board through coordinated regional strategies um, with a common end goal. And we find that um, the, establishment of the, the establishment of AMA would help us to achieve this. So um, in the area of science. So can you wrap up please, Ni? Sure. Um, so um, in the, the last area is in the area of pharmacy practice. And for pharmacy practice, we realize that um, there's the provision of regulatory boundaries for ethics of the, um, of the profession to operate. We, we, we realize that by solving the issues of falsified and substandard medicines of which Africa suffers, over 40% of the global burden, we are getting the practitioners on the continent with solutions and tools to further improve on other issues such as prices of medicines. Um, in August 2020, I'd like to ask the African Regional Office of IPSF, we adopted and released a policy statement on falsified and substandard medicines. Um, in there, we encourage the establishment of a regional regulatory focal point network to facilitate collection and compilation of um, regional data on substandard and falsified medicines and the sharing of best practices um, between national medicines regulatory authorities. Now, as young advocates of, for the complete abolition of um, substandard medicines and the harm it brings to many Africans and our economies, we wish to support um, the ratification of this agency by our governments. Thank you so much, Philip. Thank you very much, Ni Ufulianan, for sharing your perspective. Dr. Ivan Jenga, as a passionate NCD advocate, what is your thoughts on the establishment of this organization? Why NCDs will benefit immensely from the harmonization? And how can AMA enable early access to innovation for one of the fastest growing disease burdens in Africa? Uh, then thank you, Philip, and good day to all, wherever you are. I'm really delighted uh, to, to be joining uh, uh, all of you to see how we can uh, enhance and uh, strengthen AMA and actually get all the countries to, uh, to sign the treaty. One, why do we need the, the medicine agency now? From the advocacy aspect of uh, our, our civil society, what we do know that we have problems in regulating uh, safe and efficacious uh, medicines, not just for NCDs, but even for the communicable diseases. So how will AMA uh, help us uh, access uh, innovation? It will enable institutional collaboration of scientific and regulatory resources that will help us improve efficacious and quality medicines. We can have, through AMA, we can have pooled investment in regulatory capacity, and harmonize the regulation of medicines in the region. We will, uh, it can, this agency can also help us uh, provide a favorable regulatory environment for pharmaceutical research and development for local production and trade across countries. Our friend Mary talked about uh, availability of sickle cell diseases and also this goes along all the other NCDs and even communicable diseases. If we can do this locally, and do it across the countries in the, uh, in the continent, we will be better off. And I'm sure a medical agency that is uh, resulting across the continent will definitely be able to, uh, to help us launch and implement this. The, uh, the agency will also most li uh, uh, likely help to influence areas of research and development of new medicines and prioritize the medicines that, and help these rich patients through early access routes. We can have, through the agency, simplified access to information through standardized certification. We can also, and I know this will be very easy for an, an, an agency 
which is uh, uh, continental, coordinate, have coordinated market surveillance, centralized information, collection of and, and data sharing. Easy data sharing across Africa will help us improve our research uh, capabilities as well. The partnership that we can have and consolidation of funding for affordability and access to medications goes beyond, I mean, anything that we can imagine of and it will be favorable. They will also, in this era, we are all talking about universal health coverage. A medicine agency that is coordinated would definitely help us get a monitor transparency to, towards universal health coverage. We will have potential for implementation of the trade related aspects of intellectual property rights with flexibility, which can help us afford access and access to NCD medicines. Please note that not all AU members countries have ratified the trips. So this is a, 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 a we already know about the recent petition for equitable access to the COVID-19 vaccine. So I do believe that AMA will help us harmonize a continental wide competent regulatory authority, will provide a centralized expertise to increase timely access to medicines to and health technologies to the patients in Africa. A coordinated uh, regulatory harmonization will go on to give us a safe and efficacious medicines across Africa with scientific opinions and a common framework for all of us to work from. So Philip, I think that's in a nutshell. I know uh, I, I have put a strong case for the medical uh, medicines agency and uh, I would really want, and our, our NCD Alliance Kenya is very much in support for this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Njenga, for your well, well thought through uh, uh, presentation. And uh, already I'm seeing quite, I've seen quite a number of comments and questions that have been put in the chats and we'll be addressing them at a due course during some uh, part of this meeting. So recognizing your role in the fight against fakes, Oxana Pizek, lecturer, global engagement lead and founder of UCL Fight the Face. Can you share your perspective on, of, or the perspective of those fighting against falsified medicines? How can AMA improve patient safety as reflected in WHO patient, patient safety plan and AMA's role in post-marketing authorization and supply chain security? Thank you so much, Chair, and thank you to all previous panelists who put forth a, a very uh, compelling argument towards um, uh, the value of AMA. As we know, uh, the WHO has estimated that one in 10 medical products in uh, low and middle income countries is substandard or falsified. And of course, in some regions, uh, that er number is, is far larger. And we have seen a surge during the COVID-19 pandemic that includes everything from PPE to testing, diagnostics, and even now vaccines. And the Fight the Fakes Alliance, which is working towards uh, raising awareness on this highly neglected issue um, across the world, uh, comprises of over 40 global partners, um, and some of them are on this uh, panel as well, um, to support patients and people who are uh, also victims of these crimes um, and that disproportionately affect low and middle income countries. We know that the burden of uh, substandard falsified medical products uh, are within um, Sub-Saharan Africa, one of the highest regions, and this is critical for um, all of the cross-border collaboration, the harmonization of regulations, as um, other uh, panelists have uh, alluded to, in terms of being able to uh, protect patients from these uh, low-quality uh, products, uh, at particularly at a time of crisis where we see uh, more of them uh, arise. And, and only recently we have heard in the news about um, 3,000 doses of the COVID vaccine uh, being identified in a Chinese factory and 2,400 in South Africa uh, via a international uh, fake vaccine ring that the Interpol organization was able to bust up. So 
the importance of uh, AMA is, is critical now more than ever and ties into the WHO patient safety plan directly um, through this concept that Dr. Tedros, WHO Director General has been pushing um, uh, you know, in all of his term, which is the concept that there is no universal healthcare coverage uh, without uh, quality medicines. And again, uh, the AMA uh, will have a significant role in ensuring that uh, there is a, a better and more harmonized response towards the identification, prevention, detection, and response uh, strategies. And, and we've also heard from uh, the, the Pharmaceutical Students Association uh, Federation as well, highlighting the role that education and pharmacists play in, in preventing it, working with um, the goals of AMA and other organizations. Uh, so again, it will require international collaboration and transparent, uh, transparent reporting in order to bring these uh, th this issue of uh, fight the fakes uh, towards a level that, uh, again, is feeding into antimicrobial resistance and other um, and other problems that are all interrelated. Uh, you know, we have we, the previous panelists really highlighted the dangers of uh, a, a, a falsified antimicrobials and that we all need to join forces. The lack of national regulatory and technical capacity uh, has been one of the the, the weak points around this, fueled with misinformation uh, that also then leads to people outside of um, traditional marketplaces to be able to, uh, uh, to purchase medicines. This is why um, the post-market surveillance, um, as well as strengthening supply chains, is, is vital in protecting that quality, uh, but also will reduce uh, the, the amount of people that are going towards these gray markets uh, and supply chain security is another aspect that globally uh, is more important now than ever uh, via COVID and AMA uh, will be one of the most important aspects of. So I think that uh, my final point would just be that, uh, you know, we need to join forces on this and, and, and a call to action for all to fight the fakes. Thank you so much, Oksana, for sharing your thoughts and your perspective, especially on the impact of AMA on falsified medicines in Africa. I think the issues around COVID to a great extent has, for many countries in Africa, has, has awakened governments to think about local production as much as possible. Because as the initial part of lockdown, there were a lot of, challenges with drug supplies and supply chain as a, as a follow-up to supply chain disruptions. Um, Mr. Emmanuel Mujuru, as board chair of the Federation of African Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association, what are your thoughts? What do you think AMA will help boost local manufacturing and innovation capacity in Africa? Uh, thank you, Philip, for the introduction. If you may allow me to speak off camera. Um, I represent the Federation of African Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association, uh, which is an association that represents uh, African manufacturers. And our membership is drawn from regional manufacturing associations who are drawn from regional economic uh, blo uh, blocks, which are recognized by the AUC, the African Union uh, Commission. Currently, our membership includes the East African region represented by FIAPMA and the Southern region, which is represented by SAGMA and the Western African region, which is represented by WAPMA. And um, our vision as a FAPMA is to be a vibrant, self-sustaining um, pharmaceutical manufacturing industry in Africa by providing quality and affordable medicines so as to contribute to the reduction of disease burden and promote economic development of the continent. And our mission as FAPMA is to facilitate collaboration between regional pharmaceutical manufacturing associations to address the common challenges faced by the industry and enhance opportunities towards self-sufficiency. This will be achieved through advocacy and partnership with, stake with other stakeholders in promoting the production of quality affordable uh, medicines. Before I do my main talk, I would want to bring into perspective uh, uh, 
especially the participants, to the situation in Africa. Uh, Africa at the moment, especially Sub-Saharan Africa, is importing 70%, 70 of its medicines. And 30%, only 30% is being produced locally. And uh, it is out of that re realization that the African Union Commission, the AU then, came up with the pharmaceutical manufacturing plan for Africa, which then led to the pharmaceutical manufacturing plan for Africa business plan, which is the implementation uh, document for the PMPA. And PAPMA was part of that advisory board that was involved in the formulation of PMPA. And since then, PAPMA has adopted the business plan as part of its foundational strategy. I'm saying this because um, it is through the PMPA and the various initiatives that were undertaken under the PMPA implementation framework that led to the birth of AMA or that advocated for the uh, creation of AMA. Uh, the PMPA strategic business plan identified medicines regulatory and registration harmonization as being central to the promotion of pharmaceutical production in Africa. This came from the realization that most African countries did not have strong regulatory systems. Some of the national medicine regulatory authorities were poorly resourced or underfunded, threatening patient safety. Regulatory systems were not harmonized, requiring different applications for each national market. This caused delays in product registrations. Lengthy registration delays denied patients access to effective, affordable, and efficacious medicines. Some national markets were too small. Harmonization would result in larger markets which created economies of scale. Africa currently has a population of 1.3 billion, we estimated at 1.3 billion, and with more than 52 countries. So we've got a number of small markets which make it difficult, especially where economies of scale or specialized manufacturing units are required uh, to uh, make specialized products. And the regulatory barriers that are created by national medicine and regulatory authorities make it extremely difficult and expensive for medicines to be traded across the countries. And this creates a very high and very difficult uh, non-tariff barriers for the movement of medicines within African countries. To address these challenges, uh, AUDA, then NEPAT, uh, African Union Development Agency, initiated the African Medicines Regulatory Harmonization, AMRH, program to strengthen regulatory systems and promote restriction harmonization in Africa. This resulted in regional harmonization programs in East Africa, Southern Africa, West Africa. And this led to culminated in the birth of AMA. APMA has always been advocating for the formation of AMA and regional regulatory uh, authorities for the following reasons. Creation of large markets, which will ensure economies of scale, resulting in competitive production costs. It will also remove non-tariff barriers in the movement of medicines between countries, which adds to the cost of medicines. It will result in, a, in an establishment of a strong regulatory system that protects the African patient from counterfeits and substandard medicines, which threatens their health and safety. It will also ensure that African patients have access to safe, effective, and affordable medicines. This also reduces registration costs, approval times, and delays, which are a major barrier to manufacturing products in Africa. AMA also boosts um, African pharma and manufacturing companies by the creation of a huge pharma market, as I mentioned, and creating economies of scale, resulting in gains in production costs. And it also reduces registration times, which we are currently facing. In other countries, it requires more than 24 months just to uh, register one product. So that in itself it creates momentous and uh, huge uh, barriers of entry uh, if one wants to manufacture products in Africa. And it also uh, created a one-shop licensing of manufacturing facilities and also for registration of medicines as well. Uh, this Mr. Mojuru, also, can you wrap up, please? I'm about to wrap up, sorry, thank you. Great. And it also result in, in the creation of manufacturing hubs that will supply regional and continental markets and it will promote the growth of the pharma industry and uh, also create strong regulatory uh, systems and promote inv innovation and investment in new technology, such as vaccines and biopharmaceuticals and other specialized medicines like your anti-cancer drugs 
and so forth. And with that, I would like to thank uh, the organizers, uh, I, International Federation for Pharmaceutical Manufacturers, and also the, the host for inviting us. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mujuru, for sharing your thoughts. And I can relate to many of the things that you mentioned. I've been privileged enough to travel across some of the countries within Africa, some very, very strong, a small country, and sometimes when you enter the country, there's virtually no regulatory capacity. And many of these countries uh, are flooded with a, a number of falsified and substandard medicines because the companies with the good quality affordable medicines find it very difficult to uh, present those years and also to make these products accessible to patients. Just to go to the next uh, speaker, I know we find ourselves in Africa where many times we have, among the challenges that we have, there are no therapies available for neglected tropical diseases. Dr. Yao Asari Abwaji, as head of cl regional clinical operations at the Drugs for Neglected Tropical Diseases, can you share your perspective on product development partnerships and AMES role in fostering research and innovation and how the continent of Africa can benefit from your organization? Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, I have also invited uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Benoit, who is the head of regulatory affairs for drugs for neglected diseases, and she's in the audience. So if we have any regulatory questions, I'm sure she'll be happy to uh, address them. Uh, drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative is a small not-for-profit research organization developing treatments for the most neglected patients. These new treatments are usually the neglected tropical diseases or NTDs that are endemic in our regions and big pharma companies do not see any profit from developing such drugs. Uh, an African medicines agency will greatly enhance the speed with which these medicines can get to the patients. DNDI currently runs many trials in Africa in Kenya, Ethiopia, Sudan, Uganda, the DRC, Benin, Guinea, Ghana, to just name a few. These are all multi-site studies in Africa that need approval by health authorities and ethic committees in these countries. However, the lack of harmonized requirements coupled with lack of resources makes the time to approve the start of these studies long and burdensome and that it increases the time for drug development, which by itself is a very long process that doesn't need any added um, delays. Organization, organizations such as DNDI cannot afford to have as many requirements as we currently have in Africa. There are about 56 different health authority requirements. All the efforts that have already been done could now be centralized at the AMA level, which could be the platform to share expertise, do the review of dossiers together, you know, not reinvent the wheels, but bring specific local expertise to ensure not only the quality of the products, but also the products are targeted for the needed population. You know, taking into consideration conditions in the countries like the shelf life of the product, storing conditions, et cetera. Harmonization efforts at the national and regional levels could be centralized at the AMA levels, at the AMA level. Other areas where an African medicines agency will be of great help include publishing areas of unmet needs for new medicines that potential research organizations can focus on for their development pipelines, similar to what the European Medicines Agency does for big pharma. This will be of tremendous help to companies that genuinely want to do drug development in Africa. Uh, it could also work on a harmonized approach for approval authority, 
authorization of medicines in Africa. This ensures there are clear guidelines for pharmaceutical companies to follow from preclinical to regulatory approval. It can also provide a forum for research organizations to discuss scientific, legal, and regulatory aspects of their medicines as the EMA currently offers to pharma companies. As the African Medical uh, Medicines Agency takes over the work of regulatory approval, the regulatory agencies, which are usually constrained by scarce resources, can then focus these scarce resources on conduct of clinical trials in their countries and fighting on safe and unregulated drugs on their markets. Also, they can ensure quick access to drug supply issues, distribution, maintenance, and ensure quality of the drug to reduce counterfeits, etc. Um, the current pandemic and subsequent scramble for vaccines um, from the, uh, for the African continent is a sharp reminder of what could be in store for us if we continue to drag our feet on this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yao Asai Waji, for sharing the perspective of the drugs for neglected tropical diseases initiative, and in, in general about how AMA can impact drug development in Africa in general. I think we've heard quite extensively about the patient's perspective and how patients can benefit from AMA. We've also heard from an NCD advocate cons concerning how Patients with NCDs in Africa can benefit immensely from the establishment of AMA. We've also had the opportunity to hear from our advocate in the fight against falsified medicines, which Africa, to a great extent, a number of, due to a number of reasons, which includes the absence of such a body, is a dumping ground for many of these products. We've also taken the perspective of local manufacturers association on how an AMA organization can impact greatly many of African countries' quest to produce a number of products lo locally. And also we've had just quite uh, uh, the perspective of uh, the Drug Development Agency. Dr. Margaret Agamanyete, as head of division of the Department of Health, Humanitarian Affairs, Social Development at the African Union, Commission. I know your tax this afternoon is, is big. May I kindly ask for you to share your response or your perspectives on all the presentations that have been made by all the stakeholders or experts for this, uh, this, this meeting. Uh, good afternoon, um, um, our dear moderator, and thank you to all who have invited us this afternoon to share our perspectives. On, uh, on the African Medicine Agency. And indeed, huge thanks to panelists who have spoken uh, before me and have shared their rich uh, uh, perspective and passion uh, with regards to the soon to be established African Medicines Agency. I believe my colleague and friend Emmanuel who spoke uh, before me provided some background details as to um, how the African Medicines Agency is coming uh, to be established. Its treaty was endorsed by the heads of state and government in February last year. And in order for it to be established, it must, the treaty must be ratified by a minimum number of 15 member states. As we speak today, we have at least eight that have fully ratified and 18 that have signed the treaty. Now, signing the treaty means that they have, they have expressed interest and aligned themselves with the content and intent of the treaty. And the ratification, which is a national process, uh, means that national laws will be um, realigned to accommodate the intent and purpose uh, of the treaty. Now to move uh, slightly forward um, and having listened to um, many of the 
of the very passionate um, intents that our panelists have for the African Medicines Agency. I would, I would, um, I would just clarify a few things. Uh, first of all, the functions um, have been decided to a large extent uh, within Article 6 of the treaty. So I encourage um, many of our listeners and readers to familiarize themselves with these functions. And the reason being is while many of our panelists have spoken to what the, in, uh, the intended fu um, functions of AMA will be, they have also, there's a lot of assumption and a bit of a stretch as at currently as to what AMA would actually be able to, would be doing. Um, AMA is being established by a treaty of the, of the Africa Union. And what this means is that our member states must then sign up to be part of the African Medicines Agency. And that's why the signing and ratification is important. And, and so if a member state does not sign up, it, is not, it, can, it, it does not become a state party to the treaty. And I'm saying that th this is extremely important because the perception that once AMA is birthed, it is for all member states of the continent is not immediately correct. And it will have severe implications for countries who don't sign up and where regulatory systems are weak and, and not insufficient to meet the needs or, of its people. Um, AMA would also be governed by a director general and a governing board. And the governing board will have a rotatory membership amongst the AU recognized RECs, the regional health bodies and authorities, and, and uh, members and state parties and, and so on and so forth. So to a large extent, they, they, this, is, this is where the influence on AMA is going to come from. AMA is also not going to, in, even for state parties that have signed up to the treaty and are state parties, AMA will not interfere with the sovereignty of the member states unless invited to do so. So as much as uh, uh, AMA would be our second health agency to the Africa CDC and will um, build on the existing uh, African medicines regulatory harmonization program spoken to by uh, Emmanuel and will intend to um, have some sort of continental harmonization approach, it would also be um, very respectful and defer to the sovereignty of individual member states. Um, the, the issue raised around uh, uh, COVID and the realization that it brought, indeed, this is one of the reasons why we are pushing and scaling up uh, for the establishment of AMA and it's pretty much linked with what our colleagues from WHO said, uh, fighting the fakes, is that during the co uh, uh, COVID period, it, the realization of the amount, the numbers of fake products, not only medicines, but medical products, uh, PPEs, et cetera, uh, and, and, uh, and others, uh, testing diagnosis and so on and so forth, that have flooded the continent, especially given our weak barriers. One, uh, the continent has received a lot of gifts which have come in unregulated and, and, and to a large extent, uh, um, what is not, what doesn't meet regulatory standards in the West is often offered or passed on uh, um, um, to, to the African continent. And this is one particular area that we see AMA as a continental agency would have a strong role in, um, in, um, in assisting with the regulation, regulatory regulation 
of, of, of um, such uh, medicines, medical products and technologies uh, during su uh, such circumstance. There is, there is issue of um, local manufacturing um, has been raised. And um, while there are functions of AMA which will be linked with uh, local manufacturing, um, these functions will again will need to be strengthened and it will be good since there are already uh, several countries which um, um, manufacture various degrees of, of medicines, medical products and technologies. Some of sadly are manufactured on our continent but taken to Europe and uh, Africans do not have access uh, to those products and it, it will be an area that would be important uh, for the attention of AMA. I was pleased when uh, traditional medicine was raised because yes, indeed, uh, traditional uh, um, focus on the regulation of traditional medicines, which is currently a highly unregulated uh, area. Uh, not only do we have um, uh, traditional medicines from even outside of the continent coming into the continent, but our traditional um, um, medicines producers are not uh, effectively and efficiently uh, regulated in, in, in majority uh, of our member states. Um, uh, our colleague from Kenya importantly mentioned the AFCT, the African Continental Free Trade area. And of course, it's reached to the 1.2 billion uh, population of the continent. Uh, you can imagine that one of the biggest, that one of the, one of the uh, most important products that moves across our borders are pharmaceuticals. And therefore, with opening up of the Africa Free Trade Agreement, uh, the whole issue of pharmaceutical regu uh, regulation uh, um, becomes a front and center, particularly given that um, a, vast uh, a, a vast majority of our population are, uh, are faced with false, fake falsified and counterfeit uh, medicines and medical uh, products. Again, this goes back to the ratification of the treaty and the fact that if you don't ratify, you are not a state party. And so civil society has a major role in, in, in ensuring that its member states ratify this treaty. Because you can imagine if country A is not, is not a state party, but country B next door is, you, you, uh, um, these products can be either manufactured there or be brought in to uh, the continent through that country and yet and still find its way to other countries. Uh, and, and again, I'd like to place an emphasis on, um, on generics because uh, I think that the future of AMA is also going uh, to be determined largely in the area of the regulation of generic drugs. Um, the issue around TRIPS uh, fl uh, flexibility was uh, mentioned. It's an important one. I will not belabor it. There are already discussions around it with regards to the COVID uh, vaccine uh, production uh, on, the, uh, on the continent and what TRIPS, the TRIPS uh, flexibilities are going to uh, mean for Africa, uh, given that many, um, there are hardly uh, any countries if none, and I hope uh, those who know better can correct me, that actually are producing active pharmaceutical ingredients on the continent. So uh, that's an, a, another ma major area, of course, that uh, uh, would be important um, uh, for, for AMA. And there were okay. another of, of other areas that would, were, were referred to. I will not go to them in detail, I think with colleagues, uh, read the treaty and familiarize themselves with it, they will clearly know where to put the strength of their advocacy, uh, bearing in mind that once AMA is established, um, the, the functions as laid out in the treaty will then have to be put into an operational uh, business plan. 
So thank you once again, and I take the colleagues to the, the opportunity once again to thank all colleagues, and particularly and especially WHO who is here with us and who has uh, support, who has already uh, said, have joined us with extremely uh, strong advocacy for the establishment of AMA. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gama, for, for sharing your thoughts and also for endorsing the numerous calls for the establishment of AMA. I'll just uh, recap one statement that you made, which is very, very important that civil society needs to work and get as many countries ratifying the treaty as much as possible because it will inure to all countries that have ratified uh, collective benefits. I've seen a number of chats, uh, comments in the chats. Um, the treaty, the AMA treaty has been shared in the chat. So for those of you who want to familiarize yourself with the details, of the treaty, you can check in. The, you can check the chat, and you you click on the link. Secondly, as well, we are going to have a closing session for an an award session for the conference right after this. The link for the conference has also been shared, and right after this session, we will all move into the awards ceremony. Next, I will be calling on Mr. Kawadeep Semi, CEO of at the International Alliance of Patient Organizations to give us a call to join the AMA Treaty Alliance, which is critical as a follow-up to all the presentations and perspectives that have been shared. So Kawadeep, you have, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. I'm so happy to be joining everybody in Nairobi. I was born up and brought up in Nairobi, graduated there and um, lived there uh, enormously before coming to London. So I'm speaking as a true African, the 44th tribe. I think AMA is absolutely the kind of thing we require in future because it's that um, Kwame Nkrumah's vision of um, a truly African on Pan-African institution. Uh, we are now pursuing this uh, business as Dr. Agame has said, it's a whole of society whole of government and whole of patient movement uh, effort to promote this. So I'm asking all of you who have joined us to join our African Medicines Agency Treaty Alliance. Uh, the Alliance is an informal working group that will be from all interested parties. And our main aim and objective is to help and guide and ensure that we have a patient-centric, people-centered, African Medicines Agency in Africa that uh, helps us uh, to co-create that future we want. As you know, COVID-19 has reset our buttons or our social contracts and uh, we need this agency now. And I thank you all for joining us and hope you can join us uh, after this with the African Medicines Agency Treaty Alliance, uh, which will be supporting the effort to get this treaty ratified. I'm sure we can get 15 African countries to agree on something and ratify this treaty. Please sign on. Uh, you know, we are waiting, you know. It's bad business that during pandemic, you do not sign an important document. Please ratify it. Uh, the future generations are not gonna excuse us, you know. They'll be looking at this and saying, what the hell were they doing? procrastinating on the navels during a pandemic, you know. In the middle of a pandemic, we are not ratifying the most important thing that could get out. It's like somebody in a well, you throw him a rope and he doesn't want to take that rope. That rope is here for us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kawadi, for sharing your thoughts and also for rallying the call for as many countries as possible to sign on to the, to the treaty. I like one of your comments and your allusion to Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, who foresaw some of this vision whilst he was alive. And to say, please sign on to the treaty. Future generations in Africa, not just in Africa, but beyond Africa, because we have Africans in numerous places all over the world. And they'll be looking up to us to take the right decisions that will impact on the overall quality of life of Africans as much as possible. Before we wrap up this session and close. Uh, we're not doing so well with time. Uh, first of all, I would, um, I, I, I've seen quite a number of comments and questions that have been put in the chat. I think for, 
because we don't have a lot of time, those questions will be addressed and then individually to uh, direct uh, questionnaires that put up the questions. Um, just before I close, I, I just want to uh, use opportunity to thank the organizers of this conference, the IFPMA sincerely for hosting this session, the expert panelists who have shared their thoughts and aspirations for the ratification of AMA Treaty and especially that of Dr. Agama for endorsing that call. Largely, the world is looking up to us to take this very, very important decision that will impact on the collective health of Africans. And as, as commented in one of the chats, that unless every African is safe, no African is, is safe. And one medicine which is falsified can move from one country to the other easily. And before I wrap up and close and move into the award session, I would like to use the opportunity to quote a very popular African proverb that says that if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far together, go together. Let's continue to work together. Let's continue rallying the call to bring as many countries to the point of ratifying, signing the treaty and ratifying the, the treaty as well so that it can inure to the collective benefit of everyone. Just, just to announce once again, we are going to have a very special closing and award session. And please take time off your very busy schedule to join us as we take our opportunity to recognize Af leading African health leaders who have impacted the continents with the kind of with their works and contributions to research. And I want to use the opportunity to recognize and acknowledge distinguished guests who have joined us from the northern part of. Africa to the east, to the west, and also to the south. Thank you very much once again. We will move on to the award, award session. Please, the uh, link to the award session has been put in the chat. So kindly clean, click on the link, and then you'll, be move, you'll move directly into the award session uh, and closing session auditorium.